to tonight's lecture. It is entitled um, Fossil Fuels Improve the Planet. <coughs> My name is Brittany Rivera and I am from the Center for Industrial Progress. I'm your speaking coordinator. Um, special thanks to Micah for hosting the event. We're very happy to be here. Um, so tonight, um, our lecturer will of course be Alex Epstein, as you know, and he's from the Center for Industrial Progress. He is an energy expert and philosopher and he is the president of the Center for Industrial Progress. He is the author of Fossil Fuels and Proof of Planet, and his writings have been published in Forbes, Investors, Business Daily, and the Wall Street Journal, among <coughs> hundreds of others. Um, and he has spoken to, about the economic and environmental benefits of fossil fuels at dozens of universities, a few to name would be to UCLA, Rice, and Vassar. Um, and he's also de defended uh, fossil fuels in debates against Greenpeace, uh, 350.org, and also the Sierra Club. So after the lecture, he will go ahead and open the floor for questions, and we'll go as long as you guys want to go. I just want to make sure um, that you're asking the most challenging questions that you can, because that's why we're here. And um, in addition to that, if you can keep the questions concise, that would be uh, best for everyone. And um, I think that's probably all we need to cover for the, for the Q&A portion. If you want to know more about what we do at CIP, you can visit us at industrialprogress.net. Uh, feel free to Facebook, Twitter, do whatever you want during this event, but again, please keep the phones off of uh, me. So if you wouldn't mind, help joining me and welcoming me on such time. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to correct for you. you guys can ask only easy questions if you want. That would make my, my day a lot easier. All right, so we've never met, so I have no idea what you guys think about things. The, the Dick Cheney masks give me a slight hint uh, with some of you, just <laughs> wishing that the Bush administration would come back. <laughs> uh, so I want to play a little word association game. So um, we're going to go around the room, there's a bunch of you, so thank you for coming. And I just want you to pick one or two words uh, that you would use to describe the fossil fuel industry, just so I can get an idea you know, where people are, and that way we can tailor it a bit uh, more. So, gentlemen. <laughs> What's that? Large. Large, okay. We're just going to go around again. Okay, you can pass. <laughs> no, no, come on. You have to have some opinion. Harmful, okay. Thank you. Rich, okay.
Labor Association, what do you think of when you're a fossil fuel industry? Um, horrible. Successful. I'll pass. Controversial. All right, thanks everyone for playing. Julia in the back. Um, great. So let's just, just so I know, um, I'll give you three options. Who supports divestment, is against divestment, and not sure. Supports divestment. Okay, against divestment. Uh, and not sure. Children were born with soft bones and cancer rates rocketed. 
Large amounts of highly toxic acids, heavy metals, and other chemicals are emitted into the air that can breathe and leak into surface and groundwater. Villagers rely on this for irrigation of their crops and for drinking water. So it, that's dirty as can be. So, I mean, should we divest from this kind of thing? Yes. Yes? Who well, would say yes? That's where they make the magnets for wind farms in China. Yes. Yeah. So this is, I'm, what I'm describing here is one of the central processes in wind power and also solar power. So who would raise their hand and say we should divest from these technologies? Companies, not technologies, right? The companies that do that. Well, actually, inherent in the technology is that process, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mining process that requires you're trying to extract a certain very tiny amount of stuff. Um, but the industry as a whole is generally, at this point in time, complicit. Um, but anyways, uh, I just want to show again two things that we should divest from the wind industry. Wait, so, just, so you're saying that the process can't be improved? No, I'm not saying the process can't be improved. So we'll get to that in a second. So that, that might be a reason for not wanting to divest. Um, okay, so not, not many hands, so, um, which is interesting, right? Because this is, uh, in terms of you know, this is a very, very deadly process, and if we look at you know the number of lives actively taken by sources of energy, this is you know per person uh, greater than than fossil fuels, and yet there doesn't seem to be much interest. So I'd be curious for the most adamant people why why isn't this sufficient justification? By the way, I do not think we should divest from them, but I'm just curious because. So does anyone have any thoughts on that? Yes. Well, especially if it can, if it can be improved, like, that's just not a very good reason to divest from something. Okay, but what if it can be improved to the point where a certain number of people will necessarily die? Uh, well, I guess you have to compare it to the other options. Okay, interesting. So you have to compare it to other options. Um, anyone else? said, I mean, with, with, any, with any technology that human beings undertake, there are always going to be benefits and there are always going to be hazards. And just a point I want to make about these issues, and whenever we think about them, we have to be really, really precise and clear about what is the big picture and what are the benefits and what are the hazards. We need to think clearly about both of them. So simply say, pointing to something and saying it's dirty is not enough. Otherwise, we should ban windmills uh, and solar panels, which involve, uh, involve lots of uh, toxic material. And again, I'm not remotely in favor of that. I think those technologies uh, should be free to compete just like anything else as long as there are proper laws. So in general, the attitude is we've got to look at the big picture and then we see problems we want to solve. So the agenda I want to have tonight for fossil fuels is to try to take an objective look at the big picture, both positive and negative, and you know, compare it to other technologies uh, and see how it adds up in this my own uh, process of doing this, I had no, when I got into energy, I had no pre-existing interest or knowledge of any of this. It's pretty much the process that I went through in coming to the conclusions that I've come to, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. So we're gonna start out with, uh, with benefits, and you know, I, I did a lot of reading on uh, Vassar material this week. I saw my name pop a bunch of times, so I figured I might as well learn about myself. And uh, I saw a lot of arguments about this issue. One thing that was interesting and a bit disheartening is that there was very little discussion of any benefits of fossil fuels. It was, it was kind of taken as obvious that you know whatever benefits they are, we don't really need to talk about, and that they can easily be replaced. Uh, by something else, and yet the fossil fuel industry produces 85% of the world's energy, oil industry produces 95% of the world's transportation fuel. Usually when something is that dominant, uh, it usually means it's, it's either doing, uh, you know, it's almost always that it's doing a good job, particularly if it's a big country. It's usually not that one country is giving an unfair policy, it's that there's, it has some advantage. So let's, let's look at it. And just to make it easy, I think let's divide the benefits into two questions. What do we use fossil fuels for? And then why do we use them? And this is a really key question. Why do we use them instead of others? And, and to make it even simpler, let's just focus on oil. Because we're in the Rockefeller building, 
right? Oil is big oil, it's kind of, you know, like the Dick Cheney people, he worked in the oil industry. Uh, oil is what I first became interested in, so we'll just take a look. So what are, what are some of the ways in which we use oil? Yes? War. War, okay. <laughs> I, I don't understand the gesture. I'm agreeing with what he says, war, because we use a lot of fuel to uh, move our troops and our missile carriers and our, right. you know, our aircraft carriers and trip. For sure, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, actually, in, right. no, so, so certainly when countries go to war, um, actually whoever has the best transportation fuel wins. So if you read the book, The Prize, uh, you learn that in both World War One and World War II, the country that had the most access to oil uh, won. the biggest guns? <laughs> well, you have to move the guns. Okay, what else? <laughs> we got war. It's definitely used to move, the, but it's used to move some other things too, not just guns. Yes? It's called the graduate plastics. What's that? I said to quote the graduate plastics. <laughs> plastics, okay, plastics. Uh, okay, so what kind of plastics? <coughs> like what? What, what, can Aaron point to, like in this, so he's, he's exactly right, one, one major use of oil uh, that we're not always focused on is that you know, oil is used to make a huge percentage of our modern materials. So can anyone name any materials in this room that are made of oil? Medicine. Okay, yeah, so if you're taking medicine, yeah, oil is, uh, has various properties that make it very good for delivering uh, medicine to your body. What else? What's it? Medicine. <laughs> yeah. The, there's definitely a petroleum cell phone. components. Yeah, most yeah, cell phones will always have oil components. Uh, if you want to take a more life and death thing, if you go into a modern hospital, the thing, almost everything is oil in one way or another. Um, oil is the best way to coat a wall to keep it sanitary. It's full of Teflon, artificial parts, uh, or oil. Pretty much if you look around all the modern materials, all the materials that someone from 1900 or 1850 wouldn't have, um, an enormous, enormous percentage involve oil. So I mean. You know, the rubber in your shoes, the glasses, if you're wearing makeup. Um, but again, all the way to things like artificial hearts, bulletproof vests, fireproof jackets. The whole world of modern materials. All right, what else is made of oil? We're kind of missing the obvious here. Light. What's that? <coughs> Light? How so? It's generated by, by the burning. Well, I mean, it, more so in the past. I mean, more so when there was kerosene and lamps. Right now, it's, you know, light is mostly coming from electricity. Uh, which is not usually used. Uh, oil is not used for because oil's specialty is, and this is the next thing that we always think of, we have war as the example, but more broadly transportation or mobile fuel. So that's mostly what we use oil for. 95% uh, of our transportation fuel is for oil. And I think it's important to understand just how, how life and death this is. So um, when we think of transportation fuel, we often just think, oh, I'm driving my car. But it's much broader than that. So if we look at what are we doing right now? We're, you know, we're sitting around, you know, very comfortable, you know, we're at a wealthy school and we're allowed to relax and talk about ideas, um, you know, with a well-lit room. Now this is something in history that, um, you know, would be very, very special. Certainly it's special that the vast majority of the population has time to relax and, you know, that we've lived as long as we have. And, and part of it is, and the greater part of it is, that we have the ability to produce so many, so much wealth that we can sustain this type of lifestyle. If someone, you know, 200 years ago came here, he, he, this, he'd find this impossible. Like, how are you guys so well fed and clothed and out here, and why aren't you all working on a farm? Because everyone's working on a farm. And the reason that we're not all working on a farm is because we had an industrial revolution where we could, instead of doing all of our own physical work, we could get machines to do our work for us. So each of us in America has the equivalent of about 600 machine people doing our work for us. And that's why we're at this standard. And if you want to take a really important category of this energy, I don't think there's anything more important than uh, agriculture, right? I mean, that's the very food supply. And I think this is where it's really crucial to understand how we use something like oil. So again, oil is 95% of the, the portable power uh, that we use. And if you look at agriculture, well, has anyone here ever heard of the population bomb? That, that idea? Okay, I'll, I'll So there's a famous uh, environmentalist named Paul Ehrlich, who's uh, he's a 
he's still at Stanford University actually, and he wrote a book called The Population Bomb, I believe it was, is it 1968. And what this captured was that in, in the late 60s, it was viewed that the entire world was on the verge of starvation. There was a population of 3.8 billion people and the view was that it couldn't be sustained. And there was some understandable justification for this because if we look at the history of agriculture um, throughout the centuries and millennia, there's a general trend that you know, sometimes you'll have a really good crop and then you'll have more kids and, and then, but then you'll have a bad crop and you won't be able to feed people and people will die off. Some people call this the Malthusian trap after the economist Thomas Malthus. So there was this view that we were all gonna fall off a cliff and it was, it was very prestigious in terms of this view. So just to read you a quote, there was um, you know, a bunch of the top intellectuals in 1970 said, the world as we know it will likely be ruined before the year 2000. World food production cannot keep pace with the galloping growth of population. Uh, the New York Times said the problem is becoming so acute that every nation, institution, every human being will ultimately be uh, affected. And Paul Ehrlich said hundreds of millions of people are going to starve to death in spite of any crash programs of our climate. 1968. So 3.8 billion people back then, and, and they were right in a certain sense. If something didn't change, if something didn't improve, people would have died with that population. Now, what's the population today? Six billion. About seven billion. Um, and the population today is better fed than it was back then, in terms of fewer people starving, the average person is better fed. So, basically, someone solved world hunger in a certain sense. You know, when you're young, everyone says, like, I want to solve world hunger, but really, that problem was substantially solved. And there are basically two causes. One was, and this is a controversial subject for another day, genetic engineering and getting, getting what was called the green revolution of getting better at engineering different kinds of crops to grow better. But the other thing was an energy revolution, using much, much more oil uh, to power machines that could, that could, um, that could you know, grow far more crops than we ever could with the technology before then. So there's a real sense in which the people producing that power, the oil industry, did solve world hunger. It sounds, it sounds funny to say because you never associate those, and yet, if we didn't have something that could do what oil does, if we didn't have something that could provide all of that power for all of those machines at a certain price, people would starve. And so this is the point, we, that leads us to the next question, why we use it? Because if it turns out that we're, that we, you know, we start getting rid of oil, and there's not something as good, that means people will starve. That means people will die, and if we make a mistake and get involved in that, that means we are uh, complicit. Yes, at some shade. So the question is, why do we use oil? And I'll tell you how my own view on this developed. You know, I grew up thinking that, well, basically, you know, oil is just this old-fashioned fuel that, that we just used to use. I mean, this is, this is what, you know, this is what has always powered the cars, and, you know, we just go on the verge of other alternatives, and the ones that you usually hear about are either ethanol, um, which is a, a biofuel, a, a plant-based fuel, and then uh, electric, you know, electricity, direct electricity through batteries, and electric. And then learning about the history of oil was really interesting because in the early 1900s, there was actually this big competition for what's going to be the portable fuel of the future. And it was between oil, ethanol, and the electric car. So this competition has been going on for a while. And then what was even more interesting was that at the time, even back then, people were saying that ethanol and battery powered cars would be the fuel of the future. So, for example, New York Times in 1911, which is 102 years ago, uh, it says the, um, the, new, the electric car has been recognized as, quote, much more economic. Uh, the Washington Post in 1915 says price on electric cars will continue to drop until they are within the reach of the average uh, family. And yet that didn't happen, and interestingly enough, the mileage on electric cars actually went that much better uh, than it used to be. Uh, not taking questions. <laughs> so we got to just listen to the rant. I don't think that's the nicest way of hearing it. My name was on the speech. Okay. So, anyway, that, that was, that's interesting. So in terms of, 
And, and, it, and it turns out that, well, there were very strong reasons for why this happened. And um, there are a couple of them, but one we can call <coughs> essentially the strength to weight ratio of oil versus a uh, battery, um, or what's called more formally energy density. So it turns out that the amount of energy that can be stored in you know, a gallon of oil is depending on how you calculate it from 12 to 16 times more that can be stored in a battery. And when you're talking about portable power, uh, strength to weight ratio is so important because you need to carry your fuel with you. So that's why you don't have electric planes because simply the batteries would be too heavy. Now, uh, this, is, this, this is nothing, um, I have nothing against batteries and I certainly hope batteries and supercapacitor technology uh, improves, but it's turned out that this has been a, the same persistent problem for a long time. Now I should say that even if you did use batteries, uh, they're almost all powered by coal and gas. Okay. So that's one. The second one was even more interesting to me, which was, was ethanol. And here's the reason. If you, if you could associate one name with oil, with the gasoline car, the oil-powered car throughout history, what would the name be? What'd you say? Ford. Anyone else? Okay, we only got one. Usually everyone screams Ford. Yeah, Ford. I mean, so Henry Ford. And it, it turned out that Henry Ford, his first car actually wasn't a gasoline car. It was the... Uh, it was an ethanol car called the Quadricycle. And not only that, I thought, well, maybe Henry Ford sort of gave up and became a gasoline advocate. Not true. To his dying day, he maintained that ethanol was, quote, the fuel of the future. And yet he made all gasoline powered cars for his career. Why? <coughs> What's that? Because it worked. Well, ethanol cars work too in a certain way. Yeah, it was more affordable. He, his company would have gone bankrupt because he couldn't compete. And again, there are really good physical reasons for this. Um, in terms of the resource base with something like corn ethanol, you have to you you have huge inefficiencies because you're trying to take all these dispersed plants and farm them, which requires a lot of oil, and then condense them and process them, and you lose so much energy in the process that it just becomes uh, unbelievably expensive. And again, this is a problem uh, that still hasn't been solved. Basically, the reason that we use a oil is really simple, ultimately. Whatever different government policies are, it's the best, cheapest way of providing affordable power that our lives depend on. So if we go back to agriculture, it is literally true that if the policy, let's say, let's take, um, are you guys familiar with Bill McKibben? Anyone? So Bill McKibben is the leader of the divestment movement. He and I have uh, bit of a history, I mean, I, he wrote, a, he like sort of started the divestment movement and then uh, we debated about it in any case. Uh, Bill is, Bill's policy is that we should outlaw 95% of fossil fuels in the next couple decades. And uh, what I maintain to him in the debate and what I maintain now is that would kill hundreds of millions, if not billions of people. It, that's just, if you do not use the best, cheapest thing, that means that people will have less of something and it will be more expensive. And if it's something that pertains to food, they will die. That's just, that's just the way that it works. So what we need to have, it's not really about oil or fossil fuels, it's our commitment to using uh, the best kind of fuel. We at Fassler believe it's important to understand that though we may benefit from fossil fuels, we, hold, we must hold ourselves, the industry and the government, <laughs> responsible for the destruction intimidation, and injustices with fossil fuels usage across the world. The divestment debate is not about whether we enjoy the benefits of fossil fuels, but rather that we understand the real human and environmental costs of continuing to support a corrupt, poisonous, and exploitative, unsustainable system. Alex Epstein has no standing as a climate or energy researcher. In fact, the Center for Industrial Progress is a for-profit group or at least none of its donor information, and by his own confession, he takes money from corporate and industrial interests. Those of you who prefer a friendly and intelligent discussion about divestment, fossil fuels, and sustainability, stand up now and follow me to the Joss NPR. The divestment campaign will be holding for freshmen ah, and nice entertainment. Job. Very, very nice. <laughs>
try to I'll try to salvage my feelings. Okay. <laughs> so actually, um, before the I'm leaving part, uh, he, he kind of helped segue into what I think is an important uh, point. Um, in terms of, uh, he said so many things. I forgot the thing he said that I wanted to talk about. Um, well, yeah, he, he talked about the issue is not about the benefits uh, we derive from fossil fuels. Now, in a sense, the issue is the benefits that we derive from a certain caliber of energy. Now, again, it's not false. There's nothing inherently desirable uh, about getting energy from fossil fuels, which is basically compressed dead plants. Right. All I'm saying is that that right now happens to be um, by far the best way, and thus the standard of living we enjoy, including the standard of living that people who are on the verge of life and death enjoy uh, is due to this. And if we look at trends, this is going to be the case for the foreseeable future. So, for example, who knows what the fastest growing source of energy in the world is? Right now. Natural gas, good guess. Nuclear, no. Hydroelectric, <laughs> Hydro yeah, that's three, no. Natural gas again, still not. Now, um, the gentleman here mentioned wind. Uh, there, are two, there are two ways to measure this. One, you can do it by a percentage growth. So if you take something with a very, so if you take solar and wind uh, in aggregate, they produce less than half a percentage of the world's energy. So if you round, you know, the next number, it's at zero percent, which is you know, pretty low. So those are being, those are increasing at a faster rate, but it's still tiny. But in terms of new energy being produced, it's by far a whole, which is why the International Energy Agency projects that for the first time in a very long time, the next 10 or 20 years, um, coal is going to be the leading source of energy in the world. And the reason for this is not you know, the United States, which actually is using uh, less coal now, it's the developing world. Coal has been the energy of alleviating uh, poverty. So whatever, and we're gonna talk about hazards and byproducts in a minute, but whatever it's hazards and byproducts, it in say China and India has led to increases in life expectancy um, Two billion people in the last 20 or 30 years now having clean water. That's made possible by electricity. And people in countries without electricity have a life expectancy of about 40 right now. So this is this is the trend. And again, we can ask, why is this, why is this the trend? And it, it really comes down to the same thing. Uh, it turns out that it's really, really difficult to produce the kind of energy in terms of as cheap and as on demand as we enjoy today. Like, it's, it's incredibly uh, difficult. In, so in the whole history of the world, there have only been three technologies that could produce cheap, on-demand electricity on a, on a large scale. So one is, is fossil fuels. So fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, that involves taking these compressed dead plants, which sort of congeal the energy of the plants over millions of years, and you know basically you can heat them up and create more heat, you create more pressure, and you can move a lot of stuff around with different kinds of engines. Then there's nuclear power, which generates a lot of heat in a, by what's called nuclear fission, and that you know, moves an engine as well. And then there's hydroelectric, which uses uh, water power, you know, the, the immense power of something like a river. Uh, now the limitation of, of water power, unfortunately, is that it can only, you can only have it when you have the right river. But in the whole history, um, you know, of energy, we only have these three, and it's just, it's very, very hard to figure out how to, you know, have these hundreds of machine servants doing all this stuff to make our standard of living uh, possible. Now, if we look at, um, so what, what I find unfortunate is that um, a lot of the people against, a lot of the leaders against fossil fuels, uh, say the Sierra Club, who I'm debating at Stanford in uh, a couple weeks, uh, they tend to also be the biggest uh, opponents of uh, nuclear and also hydroelectric. So uh, the Sierra Club is completely for banning nuclear power, uh, which emits no CO2, uh, and also uh, devotes much of its energy, energy to shutting down large uh, hydroelectric dams. So it's important to realize when we talk about alternatives that many of the people talking about alternatives are against not just fossil fuels but others, which is kind of suspicious and we can talk about but in terms of solar and wind, unfortunately, um, you know, these have had the same fundamental problems for about 75 years. And the number one problem is the sun and the wind 
don't come in on demand. They don't come in uh, consistently, and thus you have to spend a lot. You have to try to spend a lot of resources and ingenuity backing up that energy or storing. And with storage, I mentioned you know batteries are not a very efficient means of storage, so we have no really good fast storage. And so what ends up happening is they get backed up. And can anyone guess by what technology they get backed up? Fossil fuels. So if we take Germany, which is the, you know, the world leader in solar power right now, guess how many, guess how many, uh, which is really, has really ratcheted up solar and wind. Uh, does anyone know how many coal plants Germany has shut down, is shutting down? Because of all this new solar and wind? Negative 12. So it's building new capacity because ultimately they are dependent sources of energy. So what you would need, among other things, is you need an amazing storage system. And unfortunately, because the, the sunlight and the wind are pretty diluted, they're not super concentrated like oil and coal, um, you still have huge resource issues. So even if the solar panels were free, they wouldn't be economic uh, right now because of infrastructure. Right. The point again is not that we should be partisan about one form of energy or another. Or like, you know, I'll say, like, I love fossil fuels, but that's only in the sense of I love energy and, and that this is providing positive. Again, we'll talk about the negative in a minute. Uh, but it's, it's really important to realize that the value that we get from these fuels is completely vital to life. Um, and that for the foreseeable future, it, it, um, you know, it, it can't be replaced. Um, and certainly the kinds of policies that Bill McKibben and others are talking about, the policies that the divestment movement is aimed at, uh, would I, I believe, um, you know, if they were taken seriously, kill billions of people. Now, I don't think they're going to be implemented, but any degree of that, you're really talking about your most hurting people on the margin. The people, you know, people who can now have clean water but couldn't before, or the person who just got his first refrigerator or his first uh, electric. The benefits that we get from fossil fuels and that certainly cannot be replaced, uh, or there's certainly no evidence that it can be replaced by solar and wind. You know, they are life and death. So my my number one word for describing fossil fuels would be vital. Now, I mentioned we have to talk about the environmental issue. Brittany, can you hand out the other sheet of paper? Yeah. So I have some graphs. I just don't want to distract you. Right? Although I wish the other guys had come. But no energy is more dangerous than no energy is, as one thing to put. 
So you have to, this is again an issue of the big picture. This is what, like this, this issue is ultimately what caused me to start the Center for Western Progress. Because I was really surprised when I started looking at the data of um, falls of people in the environment. Because what I, you know, of course I knew all the potential harms and incidents that have happened. And I, I was always taught, okay, well, fossil fuels have this, these economic benefits and these environmental harms, you have to balance them. But then I started looking at, okay, what are the metrics that we measure, like environmental good versus environmental bad? And there's things like sanitation, clean air, clean water, how many resources do we have, uh, for sure, you know, how, how vulnerable are we, whether our climate or safe or more dangerous. And what struck me is that, we used dramatically more fossil fuels in the, the 20th century, we kept ratcheting up and up, and yet these metrics kept getting better and better. Because I didn't have any idea why this would be when you're using these, you're using more and more energy, and yet all these metrics, it's getting more sanitary, people are having more clean water, um, you know, they're healthier. Okay, it's profit, but how does that explain it? Okay, yeah, so, so part of it for sure is that, yeah, and this is, a, this is a big issue, but for sure, with, um, especially as you have, if you have the right kinds of laws, you know, people have an incentive to learn how to make their facilities cleaner. So a whole plant today is cleaner than the cleanest form of energy on the years ago. Anyone else? Why is the why are the environment better? Well our environment like things like air and water and our, well, our environmental quality in terms of our, as we experience, as we experience yeah, that, this is, I should say, I, I definitely come from the perspective of, um, you know, my focus is on environment, as the human power environment, and then we, we have to consider the entire ecosystem, but I think ultimately the standard needs to be benefits human beings, because I don't think it's right to harm human beings in the name of some other uh, species. So I'm saying human beings have gotten better off, our environment has been cleaner, yes. Like industrialized countries are going to have more money that will get moved people on the map further into the countryside, which will make it less um, damaging to the urban lifestyle. It doesn't make it any better, but it's still going up into the atmosphere, which is causing greenhouse effect. But right, so we'll get to greenhouse effect in a second. But yeah, that's absolutely right. That's so, um, you know, one, one advantage of just having you know, enough wealth and enough power and technology is you can have decentralized power. So people used to, you know, their energy source used to be the coal stove or the wood stove in their home, and they're breathing in, you know, what we would regard as insane amounts of air pollution. I mean, just imagine sitting at a campfire all day. This is why people had bronchitis at 40. And yeah, using technology, they can do that. But the, the broader idea here is that um, the natural environment is not uh, ideally suited to human life. I mean, in terms of we don't automatically get clean water because we need to burn wood and we don't, certainly don't automatically get uh, clean air. We certainly don't get automatic sanitation. And what, what is required to improve our environment, to make it cleaner and make it healthier, is a lot of physical work, just as it takes a lot of physical work to farm. You know, farming is part of our environment, how many food resources we have. So ultimately, the, the thing I realized was this energy is just as necessary for a healthy environment as it is for anything else. So just as you need it you know, to build a skyscraper, so you need it you know, to build a sewer system and modern infrastructure. And then this led to the most initially counterintuitive thing at all, which was looking at, you know, as you mentioned, the issue of the greenhouse. Um, it's interesting, I think the gentleman might have written something about me um, that I denied the greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect is a, a scientifically uh, proven phenomenon. It's, you know, basically, certain types of gases are called greenhouse gases are more technically infrared absorbers. And, you know, long story short, they have a certain effect of reflecting light back to the Earth, um, and they cause a certain warming. You know, the question, though, is how much of that and what are the consequences? And we'll talk more about that. But for me, the best, like, the thing I looked at was, okay, well, what, you know, how do we 
to get a sense of this because you're talking about the climate, it's a million different places. And I, I realized there was a whole body of, of research called climate data, which measure like the total amount of like are we safer from the climate or more dangerous from the climate. And this is this quote on this uh, document. What I saw was as the as the fossil fuel usage was going up, the climate danger was, was plummeting to the present. So even though for the last 20, 30 years, you been hearing about you know, this drought, and you know you hear all these scary stories in the news, it turns out that if we add them all up, and again, look at the big picture, that it's a much safer place to be. And it turns out that whatever has happened you know, in the climate, uh, in terms of the greenhouse effect, has been completely swamped by what energy and technology has done. And what that means is that were we to restrict fossil fuels in the way that's proposed, we would become much more in danger from the climate. So if, if, you, if you're worried about danger from the climate, you have to realize energy is your best friend. And you know, if you're concerned about fossil fuels, you absolutely need to look at something like nuclear. It's, you know, it's crazy to rule something like that. Uh, I don't know. Can you give a good example of the situation with that? All I have is my imagination. Okay, sure. Um, so let's take, so the worst form of um, climate-related death is, is a drought, you know, because food you die, right? And in the news right now, uh, you'll hear a lot of stories about, you know, there's a drought here and there's a drought there. Um, but it's hard to know, but you know, my question is, okay, are we better or worse off from droughts? And if you look at the data since 1920, um, it turns out that the deaths due to drought have fallen by 99.98%. And there are a couple of reasons for that, but a huge kind of straightforward one is that when there's a before, now that you have a worldwide fast transportation network, if you have drought, you can alleviate it. Whereas without enough portable power, you can't alleviate it. So, I mean, as a friend of mine put it, in California, he said, you know, drought in California used to mean that we would die, and now it means our strawberries go up in price by a dollar. And it's just that energy is the you know fundamental of dealing now this this doesn't you can't again, we just have to look at the evidence it doesn't rule out I, I wasn't ruling out when I looked into this that there couldn't be some effect I actually thought there would be a negative overall effect um, the fact is on net it's it's um, you know fossil fuels the use of fossil fuels coincides with a much much safer planet uh, to live on yes um, what about this is a donut transportation like is that their drought causes them in that sector Right, I mean, so this, these statistics here, and if you look at like the statistics on this, I don't regard, you see how these are upward trends, I don't regard this as the end, I regard us in progress, and part of you know, what many people in those countries want is to industrialize. Now for sure, even if they don't have transportation there, one nice thing about mobile fuel is you can take food to that. So if you have a humanitarian mission or something like that, uh, something like oil is your best friend, whereas you're not gonna, you know, you're not having a bunch of battery power in boats. Going over. But for sure, and this is a big issue of energy more broadly. For everyone in the world to have the same amount of energy usage as, say, Germany, which is also considered a model, we need more than two times the energy production. So when people talk about 95% of fossil fuels and then getting rid of nuclear and, and not having much hydro, that's over 90% of the world's production. And yet we need at least twice that, that much in terms of giving people uh, a decent standard of living. So, the burden of proof on someone to show that the negative byproducts of the greenhouse effect really justify restrictions is a huge is a huge burden of proof, and um, I would argue that hasn't that hasn't been met at all. And the fact that the data about the actual danger or safety of the climate hasn't been reported, I think, is reflects a certain kind of partisan bias. Uh, I mean, I was very shocked to discover this stuff, and once I saw it, I thought, oh yeah, that's the way to think of it. So we can talk about other aspects of the issue and um, you know, the question period. But I just want to wrap up so we, we can get to the question period. First of all, thank you all uh, who stayed. I, I really appreciate that. And just to, just to you know, just recap my view, you know, ultimately it's that energy, I and mean, the reason I, I went into this field was just discovering you know, in my 20s that energy was so fundamental to my life. This was the industry that powered every other industry, that everything I loved and cared about in life was made possible by this invisible force. And yet, I, despite having gone to allegedly you know, the best schools, it's like I 
I had never learned this. And that really got me motivated. At the same time, I thought that the way people thought about it, I didn't like it, I didn't think that they thought about a big picture. So my view uh, of fossil fuels is that they're part of a, they're part of a progressive process of energy. Over time, we want to discover better and better forms of energy. Um, but right now, these are these are the best. And I mean, the, the benefits of these human life are completely vital. vital. Uh, the hazards are, are certainly manageable. And I think we have an opportunity to go forward with fossil fuels uh, to keep finding better sources of energy and uh, to, you know, to ultimately have a better and better future for these lines to keep going up. And on the other hand, you know, I'm, I'm really scared about the divestment movement and, and some of the broader trends in the culture because I think unknowingly, because we're not taught the big picture, because we're not, and, and the fossil fuel industry is a really easy scapegoat. I mean, someone can just say, oh, you work for them, you're bad. Uh, you know, that's, that's really, really dangerous. You know, whenever you have a target that's easy to attack, uh, a lot of the worst things in history have happened when there was a target that was easy to attack. Okay. So, I hope that this makes you uh, think a bit more about it. And uh, I, on the hand, I hope you fill out the questionnaire and you can check if you want to sign up for the mailing list. And let's take questions. Uh, let me get people with this. Um, so I just want to ask you a question, kind of. Sure. Um, do you use the word like objective and big picture mm. like a couple of times? Mm. A lot of times. Um, but you're still talking from a very anthropocentric position. Yes. That's not calculating or not considering any sort of balance in the world, any sort of environmental constraints beyond the realm of humanity. So right. Yeah, that, that could be impacted by it. Right, so, so for sure, um, and I mentioned this before, so with any, in ethics or any moral endeavor, any life endeavor, you've got, always got two things. You've got an end or a goal, and then you've got a means. So part of thinking about anything is what is the goal? And, and my explicit goal is my goal is to benefit human life as much as possible. So I think of environmental issues, which I care deeply about in that context. But as I said, under no circumstance am I willing to sacrifice human lives uh, to anything else. Now we could talk about the objective basis of that view is there. But I just want to acknowledge that that's not objective. Oh no, but it is. And it's it's, it's not, actually the proof. And it's not a big picture. It, it, it's a no, no, no. limited picture. Well, I mean, that's like saying I'm doing something for a galaxy 80 million miles away, and that's big picture. That's not, big picture is again from the standpoint of the goal. So the point is, the goal, are you looking at it as a whole? No, but it is, I mean, it, what, what, let me ask this. Every animal, you know, by its nature, wants to live, tries to live. Now, human beings are the only ones who can make the decision to not act in their interest. And I think that's the wrong decision. But why, why should human beings be the exception? Why should we not pursue our lives? And why should we be willing to give up our lives for something outside ourselves? I mean, it's a, it's a big question. <laughs> well, I just want to say But I'm saying, but saying that in order to say, we consider it a big picture. In order to say that we're considering this subject and objective, right, we have to consider it the office of humanity. But in relation to humanity, so I'm saying I'm saying the goal, yeah, and the goal is humanity, or the objective is humanity. What I'm saying is I want to look at all the evidence and objectively put it together to see what serves that goal. Okay. Uh, yes. I'll just I'll just I'll just scroll. You can go. Uh, And people were saying, you know, we have to live with a lot of today's leading environmentalists, and we have to live with less. 
And they were talking, you know what? They were talking about how we need to not increase a particular kind of energy, which was electricity. Now, since then, our use of electricity has jumped enormously, thanks in part to what industry? Computers. So if those prescriptions, and they talk then about excess technology, we don't need all these gadgets and whatnot, but without that, I mean, probably some of them in this room would not be a lot. So the issue with energy is, energy is like, is like money. It's always possible to misuse it, but it's always possible to use it well at the same time. So energy, energy is the power to do work. So let's let's take issues of water, which you know is a, is a concern. There are reasons to be concerned about maybe the future of water in this country. Some of that have, a lot of that has to do with policy, but in any case, one major thing you can use energy for if you can produce it cheaply well enough is desalinating seawater. And if you can desalinate seawater, uh, among other things, you never have a water problem again. So that's the, that's the kind of and you know, I can name ten other possible things that we could use it for. Um, again, right now you have people who don't even have a light bulb or a refrigerator, but I, I don't view myself as using excessive energy. I think I use just the right amount of energy and I would like to use more. I, I sometimes like, will tell Bill McKibben, you know, he, he goes around the world flying planes telling people that they shouldn't be flying planes. And I, I, I but I don't say, oh, you're a hypocrite. Like, no, no, I'm jealous of that. Like, I want to be able to travel more. And, you know, the more that we have great transportation fuels, the more I can I can do that. The more broadly, the more energy we have, the more you know, the more money I can make for any given task, the more leisure time I can have. So I, I think of I think you, you don't want to be you never want to think when you're dealing with human beings, we've done enough or we have enough. No. I don't I don't ever believe that. Certainly not with the state of the world today. Okay, one follow up. There, and 
But that's not what's being done at all. What's being done is bludgeoning the bad things. So I don't consider that a positive. If someone says, hey, I'm going to destroy everything that makes your life possible now, and I promise I've got a solution, but I can't really explain how it works, and I can't do it until I destroy it, no way. That's, that, you know, you're, that's, that's, a, that's a deadly, deadly view. So that's, that's for sure you want... You want progress. Now, it is an interesting issue of why the McKibben and Sierra Club and Greenpeace, why are they against nuclear? Because nuclear in the 1970s was arguably the cheapest form of energy, even cheaper than coal, until the environmentalist movement made up some things which were very untrue about the safety of the technology, which probably makes a bunch of people afraid. And I understand why you're afraid, but we can talk about them. They, they don't hold up politically at all. And so they've essentially destroyed the best means of not emitting uh, CO2, and they still maintain that. And my view on that is that ultimately, if we look at their philosophy, which is my own kind of expertise, they believe that it's wrong to live the way that we do. Regardless of, they believe that before the whole theory of catastrophic building. They think it's wrong, because they think it's wrong to change the world you know, on the scale that we have. They think we should be humble and we shouldn't live on a large scale. Um, Bill McKibben, I don't know about him, but it's, he says that the hunter-gatherers have more meaningful lives uh, than we do, and he, he openly uh, believes that. So you know, if you read his book, The End of Nature, you can see. But this is a very long-standing view, historically, that human beings shouldn't change the world around us uh, very much. And that's, uh, and that's why, just to give you one more example, um, it's a lot of the leaders of the movement have said that if we had a, a perfectly free, perfectly a clean source of energy that had no hazards at all, that it should be outlawed. And the reason is because they said we would build too much stuff with it. So uh, Paul Ehrlich said it would be like giving an idiot child a machine gun. Um, so that gives you a well, what you're saying. I, I actually, I agree. I think a lot of that stuff in the community movement actually does sound rather absurd when you say it like that. And I, I, I agree, it sounds rather absurd. But in practice, the divestment campaign of Vassar, I mean, Vassar has large endowment, and we invest and they are now investing in fossil fuels. And I mean, I'm just saying, at a practical level, we take it out there and put it in alternative fuels. I mean, hopefully those damn things will like, work. But you were, you were one of two or four. <laughs> they're being selected for, the reason that they're being selected is not because they're promising. I think it's ultimately because they're not promising. But because there's this view that, that they come from the sun and the wind, and therefore they're not, we're not changing the world. No, that's not true. The companies that use alternative fuels don't think that. They're not on that level. No, 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 I'm sorry. We're talking about the companies. No, no, I'm saying, but there's an immense, if you, look at, if you look at the actual distribution of subsidies, there's an immense favoritism toward these technologies, which comes right, from... Right, we're trying to do that until they, they work, because we don't want fossil fuels. I mean, they have problems. No one's saying they don't help. But we want these alternative fuels to do what fossil fuels do as they not. As they do but, not. But, there's, but, I mean, you can want, you can want like, wood to do the same job as steel. It doesn't mean that it's going to happen. I mean, so so they're, what they're doing is that they're doing, they're, they're outlawing, they're trying to outlaw the three best ones. So it's, what I'm saying is if you want the energy of the future, stay the hell away from $350. Um, yes, in the back. Wait, hang on a second, I'm not done. No, no, no. The this campaign of Esther has nothing to do with anything political. It's moving the entire money into something else. Right. It's yeah. not going to outlaw anything. It's not, it's a, okay, the, the explicit, uh, read on um, Global Warming's Terrifying New Math by Bill McKibben, because you have to understand that. Bill McKibben has, I mean, what no, 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 you, no, no, you have to you understand. It doesn't matter, because in practice, what this is going to do is move money from one place to another. No, okay, no, no, because no, no, in practice, okay, we can talk about the economics things. In practice, divestment by itself will do absolutely nothing, right? Because someone will just, what happens, well, the share of Exxon Mobil will go down by one penny, and then someone else will buy. The explicit purpose, according to the leader of the movement and according to any sort of basic economics, is, the, is, to, shame the, is to shame the fossil fuel companies to make them hold public en enemy, enemy number one, that is a direct quote, in order to pass bans. That is the goal. So you are being used, if you don't think it's about passing bans, you are being used toward that goal. That is the, and when they, I get an email from Free Food Art, because um, I'm on their list, and they said this week, I got an email talking about how all these colleges are standing up to get rid of fossil fuels. So that's what's happening. So one last question before I okay, but um, So what you're saying is when we divest from one mutual fund which has fossil fuels and put it into another, that doesn't, that doesn't do anything to the company? Nothing. It, it has, 
a negligible effect, given that there's a huge amount of demand. Someone else will buy it. Yeah, yeah, that would be a bad one. The point is symbolic. It's a symbolic yeah, gesture. It's a symbolic it's aggregate. Aggregate. No, I mean, I think it's, it's a drop in the bucket. The idea is it's an aggregate movement. Like, this is, I know, but, but, but then, again, you're wired in the You're, but then, why, do you understand what it means? To, if you actually could bankrupt the fossil fuel companies, then you'd be doing the same thing. So it would be even worse. So if, if, you, if what you believe is right, then it would be even worse. Those other, ener all the energies should compete. What, sorry, I, I want to get to the next question. Uh, you and that. Okay, so say, you would say there's no Can you repeat the question for the live stream? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, what happens when she said, my beloved oil uh, runs out? So I mentioned that energy is, is a progressive process. You're always trying to figure out better and better ways uh, of doing things. And I indicated nuclear power as that's a, that was a, that's a real progressive direction. And that's a technology that can provide cheap power on demand. It's just been restricted by the same movement as the anti-fossil fuel movement. Now, as a practical matter, uh, you know, we're discovering better and better ways of getting oil for the foreseeable future. There's, um, if you look at the amount of oil we've used so far, it's 10, no, it's one uh, trillion barrels, and there are at least 10 trillion in the earth. So the whole issue is just an issue of technology. How fast does the technology evolve? And what's happened is people keep thinking we're running out, but the technology gets better and better. You can also make oil out of coal, you can make oil out of gas. So. There's no issue with, with running out, uh, but more broadly there's nothing, there's no issue with running out because you can find ingenious ways of doing things as long as you're free. The problem is right now, we're being prevented from using the best and forced to use the worst. So why are you so against improving the technology of renewable energy for alternative energy? I don't know, I've said it many times, they should, they should be here. I'm just saying that, they, that these are, these are like, these are the worst, energy failure. So I'm saying that there's, it's very suspicious that nuclear is opposed and they're supported. I'm saying that's for ideological reasons, not economics. So just as someone follow the energy landscape, um, if I'm going to bet on what's going to improve human life, I'm not going to bet on, on sort of using these enormous arrays of unreliable energy. That's just simply, it does it just has been a massive failure. Yes. Oh, sorry. Good. Um, you mentioned earlier that we should never feel like, we should never not want to continue having more or something like an energy, for instance, like. Yeah. I mean, to a certain extent, I agree with you, but I do think that that's kind of double edged sword. And do you think that in some way, we're kind of in this environmental bubble where the great positive to be from the use of fossil fuels will become eclipsed by negative impacts of using fossil fuels, such as the rise of sea levels. Um, rise of sea levels, for one, that's a great mm -hmm. um, example of population loss, migration, things that will, I mean, the scientists are predicting will happen. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me separate the question. Like, so there's, there's one, there's one of, is there inherent, because you, you mentioned, I said, all, I mean, I say all things being equal, more energy is better. So one is a circumstance, so the first part of the question is, all things being equal, do I maintain that? Absolutely. And then, but then the second question relies on my estimate of what are the, you know, what's the relationship between greenhouse gases and sea levels and, and those kinds of things. And as I said, the, the trend, um, you know, the trend we have is, a, is much, much better. And if we look at, uh, if we look at so, you really have to sort of, I think there's an assumption with climate change, as far as I can tell, that if man is impacting it, then it must be bad. There's, because whenever people just say, hey, we're changing the climate, and I sometimes ask people, okay, so if we were changing it to be a little bit cooler, would that be bad? And I, well, I'm just, I'm curious. Does anyone think if, if we were changing it to be a little bit cooler? We're accelerating. Climate change is inevitable, but we're accelerating. Um, okay, that's, that, but that, but that's a theory that goes from the idea that warming accelerates climate change. The only mechanism for, for accelerating the change in the climate that's positive is warming. Right, so, so all these- not cooling, so I'm sure if it was cooling, that would be negative too. We, we don't that. Uh, uh, I, think, I think 
your, let, let me just, I'll get to that in a second, but um, if, I'm just curious, show of hands, Do, if, we were, if we were causing it to become a little bit cooler, would that be bad? Who says yes? Okay, so that's, that's interesting. Because, hold on a second. Uh, 
Okay. Um, but, 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 the climate 200 years. This is there. It's 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 okay, I I control it. Yes. <laughs> um, um, unrelatedly, perhaps, but relatedly, because we're talking about you know humanity, big questions like this, um, and we're talking about maybe the divestment movement also. Um, I I just say like I, in this in the 70s, New York, there's this group called Young Lords, and they started out because they wanted more rights for um, um, Puerto Ricans, they want more equality. Um, but there were some problems with the movement, and um, for example, it didn't include women. So a woman caucus, women's caucus forms, and they submitted, um, they argued for their ideas, and eventually the movement became more inclusive. And I'm just wondering, like, why provide such a target? Like, fossil fuels improve the planet. Like, why not just do that so much? You know, so, you know so much about this. Why not? Why, why can't we like? If, if there are problems with the movement or like there are problems with views, why not like try to make them work together? I, I tried for an hour and a half, and that guy flew right to the next place and told people to adopt policies I think will kill people. So that's why. It is a fact that fossil fuels have improved the planet. But they're continuing to do so, and I see no evidence to the contrary. And I, that's exactly. The more outrageous people think it is, the more they need to hear it. Because I consider it uh, an understatement. Yes. Um, oh, I missed you. Okay, okay, okay. So I understand that like my quality of life increases because of fossil fuels. Yeah. I also am an individual that is uncomfortable with using them. So if that's the position that I take, and I respect or I understand that for fossil companies that have and use fossil fuels, they would like to continue using. I also know that many of these companies also have sectors that deal with alternative energy sources. How do I, as an individual, try to enact change that encourages companies to increase the percentage of their own funds to alternative energies? How do I, how do I get companies without saying, I want to destroy it right away? But how do I say, put a little bit more money or put a little more time into looking into this so that eventually me who's uncomfortable with fossil fuels Consider the technology is getting up to date. Because yeah. if you do want other alternatives, like you said, I think that there has to be a way for the fossil fuel company to say, part of our, we're going to try better to find alternatives. Yeah, that's a good question. I just want to make it clear I'm not like just hankering. I mean, I'm upset about how nuclear power industry has been destroyed and held back. That's because that's a real technology I know about. But again, I think overall the impact of fossil fuels is great. So I don't see it as, oh, we need to get away from it. Like, and it's hard, I mean, it's like saying, well, there are problems in using cement and steel and buildings. Well, those are the best things. So I'm always going to support the best. I'm one, always wanting better, but I don't look at it negatively. But I think the way you ask the question is perfect, because you're kind of asking, what can you do voluntarily? And I would say what people should do is, if they believe that, is they should try to start communities where you are where you are using the other forms of power and, and demonstrate that. And I find it very weird. I mean, I understand why, but I find it. People say, "Oh, we can't do anything individually. We have to do our own policy." But ultimately, what you need to demonstrate is that you can really make this work on a certain scale, so that other people have the confidence that it can be done. And this is what every technology does. It starts out small, you know, it works. Uh, so I think I think it would be much better suited to try to find the best if you really believe in solar wind, find the best companies and try to get a group of people together and live and, and really completely be supported on those. Now I think there are enormous obstacles to that and it would not work well now, but that would be the direction uh, to push for. And it's much more effective to vote with your wallet as a consumer than as an investor. Because as a consumer you can much more easily create change. As an investor saying, like, I mean, most of the people here right now are not invested in Exxon Mobil. It doesn't do anything. Um, but you are all using their fuel. Um, Maybe they should all take off their sneakers. Yeah, well, that, that's you know, people, people can decide on that. But I, I still, I, I respect the question. Yes. Um, uh, so I would like to talk about nuclear power for a minute. You're saying, you know, that it, it doesn't fully like, um, admit, you know, Maybe it's true, but that's not the problem with mm -hmm. nuclear power. It's they're set up on um, the plants are set up next to water, and they circulate water through lakes and rivers that have been heated, and that causes the biosphere disruption. Mm -hmm. And I know 
disruptions to the environment. So that's something a lot of people are concerned about. And then also, the bigger problem is what to do with nuclear waste. Because that's going to be around for tens of thousands of years. And we don't know what the world's going to look like in that state. And we don't want people to do future organisms to have to deliver the effects of these tons of, of um, nuclear waste that's extremely harmful. And if we put it in, say, like, you know, there's all these ideas where we can put it, we can't shoot it to space, it's too heavy. We can't put it in the ocean, we should, like, clean over the metals, and we can't put it in the bedrock because mm. if there's an earthquake, yeah, what's going to happen? So what do you think we could do with nuclear waste? Why, why of all the substances in the world do you think that spent fuel as we call it nuclear waste? Why is that of the largest concern? Like what empirical data do you have that, that you would worry about that? I'm just curious. I mean, it's taken for granted that we should be worried about it. There's a three-eyed fish and the Simpsons, you know, that comes from it. But I'm just curious. There's about just, nuclear It's just uranium. Yeah, it's just uranium and it has certain properties. And it's, just, it's an extreme carcinogen. And, like, I mean, if you look at things like Chernobyl and stuff like that, well, that, that wasn't a waste of storage issue. Sure. Right, but that was a nuclear, that's a uranium exposure issue. And being around, they, the sites that are nuclear waste sites are protected with military guards making sure that people don't go in these sites because they're mm -hmm. extremely harmful. Yeah, so nuclear is a really interesting, uh, I'll get to you in a second. Nuclear is a really interesting issue because, um, so. If we look at like the modern civilized world, so the Chernobyl was an incident in the Soviet Union with a pre-modern plant and a government that was deliberately willing to experiment with any technology um, and with complete disregard for human life. So any form of energy we talked about before. Uh, Can I take a little bit? I'm just saying, let's not bad about the Soviet Union. It wasn't like the plant's design. It wasn't a problem. It was like people running the plant. Human uh, error. No, I, I certainly, I mean, now that you mention it, I certainly want to badmouth the Soviet Union. <laughs> you know, that's the, 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 that's the largest destroyer of human life in, in history. I, I can't, I mean, I don't know, badmouth is just too, I mean, it was, it was completely destructive. Um, so anyway, that, that, that so Chernobyl, what? Empiricism is selfish sometimes. Like, look around you, though. But like, look at the things that aren't around. I don't quite understand, but let me, <laughs> let me just um, get to how nuclear power works. Okay, so in a normal, in a normal modern plant, what's interesting is that in terms of deaths due to radiation and the, in like the, the entire modern history of nuclear power, there are zero. So there's so this is really interesting. We're taught to be afraid of this, and there are zero. So in Fukushima, a, a piece of equipment fell on someone, but in terms of radiation deaths, it's, it's zero. Now, why is this? It's death from cancer, though, that's caused by No, none, none demonstrable. These are, I mean, people just, so part of it is that there's this idea that radiation is inherently destructive. Radiation has become this, this scare where the, oh my gosh, things are radioactive. And radiation, like anything else, like toxicity or whether some of the carcinogen, carcinogenic is an issue of degree and context. So right now, you two right there are emitting more radiation from the potassium in your blood on him than he would be, and he would get from standing next to a nuclear power. So take that for whatever danger uh, it's worth. So the question of radiation is, what's that? Okay. Yeah, I know exactly. There's walls around it. Just like there's walls around an engine. Okay, okay. So, so this is demonstrably for a huge amount of time to save this thing. And the reason is because although every technology has risks, nuclear is the easiest to contain for one basic reason, which is that it cannot, uh, it cannot explode. The nuclear power plant cannot explode. The nuclear bomb can, but it has 30 times the concentrated uranium. So if someone, as, as one of the best energy thinkers ever said, if someone blew up a nuclear power plant, he should win a Nobel Prize because he would have discovered a new law of physics. So the fact that it can't explode means that if something goes wrong, people don't die, they have time uh, to react. What about the waste? Okay, so the waste is, again, nobody has been harmed from the waste. And the reason is that because it's not the most dangerous thing in the world. Right now it's stuck in, in pools. And you can go swimming in those pools within like a meter or two and not get harmed at all. So it's not as if this is, the reason it's, it's there's just this voodoo scariness that's arbitrarily imputed to this. I mean, here's an example. Like if you eat 
you can, if, if I agree to eat the same amount of, of, of uh, plutonium as you eat arsenic, at the caffeine, I should say, you will die first. So we have a client, so there was a physicist named Bernard Cohen, and he said, I will eat as much plutonium as anyone eats caffeine, because he knew they would die. But we have to look, at, I use the term objectively, um, at what are the actual <laughs> risks of this, and I would say that this is, there's just, this has just been three decades of scare science viewing radioactivity as somehow a worse way to die than something else. And the truth is that radioactivity is much easier to contain and deal with than things that are combustible uh, slash explosive. So we've been, there, are better, there might be better ways to store waste, but so far, nuclear waste is, you know, is not an issue and we can explain why. So I just find it odd. The way we're taught to think about safety is really scary to me because we're scared about things like nuclear waste and yet, the way we're going to die is texting while driving. I mean, things like that. I mean, we can talk about nuclear waste and eating a Big Mac, and the Big Mac is going to be more dangerous than you know anything you would ever get from nuclear waste. So, really, it's important to be scientific, and particularly when people are talking about opposing fossil fuels, to give these kind of flimsy reasons for opposing the one thing that could, in the future, replace them that we know about. It, there's something else going on. Yes, and this is the whole question of technology and what's called the precautionary principle. Do you, what's that? Oh, um, do we take a stance of innocent until proven guilty uh, towards something like, uh, you know, something from nuclear waste? We take a, a position of, uh, of evidence is required to make a claim. So if someone claims that by using my cell phone, I'm going to give myself cancer in five years, he needs to give a lot of evidence. If someone claims that this substance that we the spent fuel, which by the way can be recycled, which they I should mention, which they do in France. Um, if they claim it's a danger, they have to provide evidence. Because otherwise what you're doing is every time you want to take a step forward, someone can just make up that there's a danger. Uh, so the whole principle of technology is you take forward action and if someone someone can only stop it if they can prove that it's it's damaging. And that's that's the policy that's led to the whole modern world. And without that you know, the policy of the Middle Ages was encouraged. You couldn't do anything. Yes? Yeah, I wanted to echo your point about the nuclear issue. In Japan, the tsunami killed thousands of people. Actually killed them. But that issue was buried because of the nuclear issue. It went on and on and on about this you know, potential danger from nuclear fallout. Yeah. So there's a yeah, there's a bias in thinking about stuff in terms of natural, you know, the rest of nature. If you know something goes wrong, we kind of dismiss it and we blame man. Same thing. Mean, so now, if there's a hurricane, it's all human, you know, it's all human beings' fault. But like the hurricane that wiped out 300,000 people in Bangladesh in the 70s. No one thinks, wow, I wish those guys had had some you know, modern technology and energy. And yet that's the thing that would have saved hundreds of thousands of lives. Uh, what time is it, by the way? It is 10 after 8, so we think about having All right, let's take, um, we'll take, we'll take questions from anyone. Have you, for anyone new, have you asked a question yet? Me? Have, have you? Have you asked one? Okay, you two, and then, and then you, and then you. You asked one. Well, before you raised that issue, I didn't ask a question. <laughs> okay, we'll give you a quick question at the end. We'll, we'll be the okay, go ahead. Oh, me? Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, so you discussed coal, and I don't know, I'm sure people have run the numbers on the sustainability of coal in terms of how much energy um, we can get from it and how much uh, supply we can, we can have. Um, I'm just curious what they are and how coal can be useful in the future. Well, I mean, it's, it's coal because of the geology and the history of it is always the easiest one to get. Like it's much nearer to the surface uh, than oil or gas. And it's easier to find, like oil is kind of invisible, coal is easier to find. I mean, coal is endless. There's just, you don't pour it. There's no, no one talks about peak coal. And, and the thing is, chemically, so all, all of these uh, fossil fuels, it's not even the right term. They're hydrocarbons, so they're combinations of carbon and hydrogen. 
And basically, the, um, you know, the, the lightest one is natural gas, that's why it's a gas. And then there's oil. So basically, natural gas is four hydrogens for one carbon. Oil has about two hydrogens for one carbon. And coal is somewhere around one. And there's just a ton of that. This is an absolute ton of that stuff. I mean, the reason that oil is used, the reason why it hasn't, I'm not sure why it hasn't surpassed oil, but the thing about oil is transportation and portable power is uniquely important in a modern, in just any economy. So that's why oil has for so long been the number one source of power in the world, even though it's, it's hardly used for electricity uh, at all. But now, around the world, electricity demand is growing so much, and really coal is the way, you know, is the way to do it. So in, I, the thing I was saying chemically, though, is you can go through chemical processes to convert these fuels to one another. So you can convert CH4, which is what natural gas essentially is, methane. You can, you can do what's called gas to liquids, and then you can do what's called coal to liquids. Um, and then you can also, with coal and, and gas, so this is if you want transportation fuel, uh, there's a fuel called methanol, which essentially you're, it's, it's kind of like half oil, half water. And the nice thing about that, although it only has half the energy of oil, it, you can make it out of anything. I mean, you can make it out of crops, you can make it out of coal. So with this whole spectrum of hydrocarbons, there's essentially an unlimited uh, future. And yeah, that's, that's Yes? Um, in response to a previous question, I think it was yours, um, you had said that um, we should vote with our dollars as consumers rather than investors when it comes to fossil fuels. Um, and I was just curious what you meant, like how you see like us voting as consumers in terms of fossil fuels. Like, so for example, if I believe in the local food movement, then I, you know, like act as a consumer, right. vote with my dollars and buy local food. How would I do that with fossil fuels? Or, you know, with yeah. Uh, I just want to clarify. I, I'm not saying anyone should do that. I do well, not. Yeah, no, like, and I'm against, and I would argue with someone against doing that. But I'm saying, if it's voluntary, you have every right to do it. So if, if you were to do it, maybe it be something like, you know, very rich people right now, for instance, will build, a, like I think Mark Ruffalo built himself like a giant solar array, a Tesla, and he pretends that, of course, there's a lot of oil and coal involved in that whole process, which I don't know if he knows, but in any case, leaving aside any hypocrisy, that's the kind of thing you would do. I mean, you would, you would, you would pay more for other technologies. I, I was in uh, DC, there was a big climate rally, and I, counter, I tried to talk to some people there, and you know they were all wearing like oil-based jackets, which I think they should, but if, if they are against oil, then they should, they should not use petroleum products. Again, I don't support this at all, but I'm just saying that is an actual, if you look historically, like economic boycott is a real way of affecting change if you can get enough people on your side. And, and it, it is very, with the right cause, it's a very, it's a very, very valid. Uh, instrument. So, for example, um, let's say you know you think a company has a racist policy, I and mean, that's a great kind of occasion to just say, look, this company, like, we should not support this company, and you can do a lot of damage very, very quickly with something like this. All right. Yes. So, what you just said about if some, if a company is doing something racist, then we shouldn't support them. Then, how does the the injustices that the coal Natural gas and natural gas; those the practices of those companies are very strongly racist and classes. For instance, you know the the coal mine collapse in West Virginia mm -hmm. in 2010. That was due to the due to uh, a coal company, Massey, you know, preferring to pay a fine, a safe a fine because of the safety mm -hmm. violations as opposed to actually fixing the safety violations. Or for instance, the you know, the coal you know, the location of coal plants in very low uh, low income areas. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, company uh, Yeah, I I, yeah. I got the question. Um, this goes back to the example that I put were you here at the beginning? Yes. Okay. So for for the wind power example of of you have to differentiate between the technology or industry as such and then any given uh, abuse of it. So, in terms of the coal mining, I mean, I, as I've gotten more interested in this issue, I've met a lot of people in that industry, and they are generally very glad to be in that industry, and they're very proud of it, and they're very resentful 
of people who try to uh, to stop them from being. They are certainly not regarded as racist or classist, except in the sense that it, it provides an opportunity for them. So I, I don't think at all. I, I don't know what classist means. Um, so I know I don't think it's racist. But if, if there was, if there is an illegitimate, you know, practice like you know Massey is doing something wrong, then it should be prosecuted. For that, but there's nothing inherently different about. It. I mean, you could say you could make a much stronger case for racism and discriminating against poor people with the whole manufacturing, the whole mining process of solar and wind, because those are deliberately delegated to places with enormously cheap labor and very low standards, because those technologies perform so poorly on the market that they need every advantage they can get. Whereas you can pay someone hundred thousand dollars a year in North Dakota and still make a lot of profit on oil because it's so superior. So right now, the record of the so-called green companies is abominable to use respect. So we need to be nonpartisan about it, and we need to be in favor of the right kinds of laws. Um, and when we see problems, we should fight them. But to say the industry is racist is, is wrong. But then how do, so for instance, uh, the IMF uh, said, I believe two days ago, that coal subsidies globally amount to about 1.12 trillion. Mm -hmm. And how is like to say that it's a level playing field, and right. that you know certain solar companies are getting handouts. Well, the fossil fuel industry is definitely guilty of those handouts, and Exxon, and Chevron, and Shell they fight tooth and nail to keep those, despite so, whether. All right, so I'll give a quick answer now. If you want more, I'll go to, go to Industrial Progress on that because this is a big, it's a big discussion of subsidies. But essentially, what they call subsidies are either. Um, the usual thing they call subsidies is they think that that um, basically we should add on a lot of extra taxes for the damages that they think that coal oil companies are doing. So it's not that it's not that the U.S. government is giving the oil companies any money. They give them a certain tax treatment, which has to do with whether they're what is regarded as business expense or not. And that's a whole issue. But the main thing in these these calculations, I actually we're going to post a debate soon. If I debated the main guy who's in charge of these calculations, it's called Oil Change International, so you can see how that turned out. Um, but he, it's essentially just, I mean, I think they're they are just completely wrong. And one of the things that they do is they say that there have been all these costs, all these damages uh, from climate change, and the data just completely contradicts that. And at the same time, they ignore the fact that we get tons of value from oil that we don't pay for. So for example, if you if you have to use an ambulance right now and that takes a gallon of oil, how much was that worth to you? Was it worth four dollars? It's worth like you know four hundred thousand dollars. So we it's just, there's a whole debate in economics called externalities, which we're running out of time to talk about. But fortunately, we've talked about ad nauseum on our website. So we'll do that. Yes. Um, so like in terms, you talked about like what we can do as individuals to change it, but in terms of like what is the best thing like on a policy level? have the best source of energy. Do you think it's sufficient just not to have any regulations and just to have all the kinds of energy competing against themselves? Or maybe like uh, some form of like carbon credits like we've seen for power plants that install sufficient discoveries and things? Or maybe actual like subsidies for alternative energy? So like what would be your ideal? Thing? Yeah, my ideal is for what I'll call energy liberation, which means that you have consistent laws about um, pollution and safety, um, you know, based on science, and complete freedom. And the idea is I don't regard CO2, um, yeah, and I think the evidence at this point shows that there's, you know, that there's this big harm. Again, that the, the energy that's emitting the CO2, any more than I think that, that us emitting CO2 breathing is a harm. You know, right now the machines that we need as extension of ourselves to do hundreds of times more work. They breathe CO2 just like we do. And the benefit of that is tremendous. And I don't think there's evidence that, that there's this that there's this big harm. I don't think there's evidence of temperature. I don't think there's evidence that warming is inherently bad. I think I just I think the issue has been very uh, distorted. If you could prove something scientifically then it would be a different issue. But that's that's my idea. And it's, it seems like a lot of people like don't take very much note of the fact that we actually have managed to clean up a lot of these things to a great degree through like very positive government policies of like rather than punishing companies, like giving them incentives to do things that are 
Yeah, without it. Well, I mean, one nice thing about the progression of technology, and the gentleman who's not here anymore um, mentioned the issue of becoming wealthier. You can you can have higher and higher standards of what um, what what's defined as pollution. So let's I like to use the example of let's say we just invented fire, right? We invented fire; it's the greatest thing in the world, and yet we have to breathe. Where there's you know where there's fire, there's smoke. So we are unfortunately we have to have smoke. Our kids have to have smoke. That's not the greatest byproduct. Um, but you wouldn't say, oh, fire should be illegal, or even fire is a pollutant, because you don't have any technological or economic recourse. As technology goes, you can raise what constitutes pollution to higher and higher standards, and that's part of what's happened. But it, each stage requires the previous stage. So you needed at the stage at which coal, um, you know, was a lot less clean to have the stage where it's it's more. Clean. And so I think we can keep going on that trajectory. I would just say, though, for me, the, the biggest takeaway of all of this is not, I don't think of this in terms of, like my, I know the divestment thing is framed as how do we get off, my, my view is there's a huge threat to our way of life. What do we do about that? And I'd say industrialprogress.net, check that out. Yes. Oh, wait, no, uh, I'll ask, you'll ask the last question. All right, so I think that, I'll get to I don't know how many of the people that you had this issue left in there with, but I think one of the major issues you have with some of your audience, one of the differences apart from the people who left there with, uh, is that uh, you're looking at it as a as a very people first issue. People are, or, and some people are looking at our effects on on the entire planet, and some some people are saying, well, oh, we should minimize our effects on the planet, right? Mm -hmm. Well, so as a conservation issue, we want to conserve the planet. I think I think it's important, you know, to present how does how does this fuel and the power and the energy that we get from it allow us to do things. Without this, uh, without the energy that it's giving us, I don't believe we have the power to actually change things in the future. We go back to hunter and gather, but we can't affect the planet at all, not positively, not negatively. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the different, one of the things you need to show are like, I think something that you should talk about if you can, this isn't phrasing the question very well, um, is the, the issue that what you're buying, what you're choosing, if you choose to go away from fossil fuels, is to take away power from us to do anything. We can't help people, and people will die, but we can't help the planet either. It's already, and there are already issues with people that have the planet. Mm -hmm. And if we choose to divest from our current fuel power, there's no substitute. We won't be able to do anything. Mm -hmm. We're simply choosing to take ourselves power. Yeah, I mean, I, so, I mean, I, I definitely, you said something like people first, which is, is definitely my, my view, but, but people first doesn't mean that you're not concerned with the rest of the planet. Precisely, you are concerned about it, but you're concerned about it for enjoyment because you know, there are systems that affect your life and those kinds of things. And so one, one thing to your point is that there's a really good essay actually that's uh, at the bottom of that graph that I gave out. It's worth reading. It's called Humanity Unbound. He talks about something, I forget the title, but something like how fossil fuels protected man from nature and nature from man. And I don't quite agree with that title, but one thing he points out is that, you know, with these concentrated sources of power, one thing you're not doing is you're not burning down all your forests, which used to be. So as soon as we start getting away from fossil fuels, you're just going to burn all your wood. I mean, for sure, agriculture, slash and burn, um, et cetera, et cetera. And what, you know, I guess the use I think of is I really like visiting places and enjoying them. And my capacity to do that is entirely made possible by, by mobile fuel. I mean, without oil and its equivalent, there's no, I've never been to the Grand Canyon. I've never been to you know, Italy, I've never been to France, and I can never go all the places that I want to go. So if we, if we actually want to enjoy nature, we need to be really grateful for the power uh, to do that. Otherwise, the Grand Canyon is something you read about in a book. And I mean, unfortunately, I know you guys don't like me picking, like some of you don't like me picking on the uh, um, given, but I mean, he says explicitly as the rule he says that we shouldn't really be able to travel by plane. So he says that we need to experience it over the internet. He said the, the net is the one solvent that is still for Jet travel can't be our salvation. So the kind of trip you can take with the click of a mouse will have to substitute. So I don't like that. When was that written? What's that? Yeah, when and where was that written? That was written in his book, Earth, which was released in 2010 on page 200. Uh, last question. Yeah, I wanted to address again, like the standard of living issue. Um, okay. And I don't, 
I mean, I don't disagree that fossil fuels have kind of created this what we live in now, and yes, there have been better improvements, um, but I'm still a proponent of kind of accelerating these alternative energies, and more in the short term than long term. I think it does need to happen immediately. And so I guess my question for you is more about, you know, you say like, well, if we get rid of fossil fuels right now, people won't have the same things. A lot of people will be negatively affected. A lot of people will die, and that's true. But like, how can we accelerate it so fast? And I, I just don't see there being a defense for an industry that is accelerating climate change as much as but, it is. But, 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 but I, I, I disagree. But I, I mean, I agree that it is accelerating climate change. And I think, you know, if you think of like, oh, well, he's gone, the ice, like the ice started melting. Like, at the rate it's going, the planet will warm. And at the rate it's going, like, maybe your lifestyle in Orange County won't be as comfortable as it is right now. And a lot of people in a lot of places won't even be in, like, inhabitable areas. So if we're talking about standard of living and trying to maintain that, how will we maintain it in 100 years when there is so much CO2 in the atmosphere that a lot of people can't even live where they are living? Well, people, I mean, let me try to, like, tell you how I think about climate change. So it's often said, and you raise this point, that, you know, we're designed to live in a certain climate and it's kind of fragile and, you know, we can worry about if we change it. And my view is that there's no evidence that's true. We are masters of climate change. Human beings, even if you just take the United States of America, we live in every single climate imaginable. We have polar climates, we've got Arizona, we've got Southern California, we've got every climate imaginable, all different types of storms, and we all can expect to live to eat. And the reason is, is because we have the thing, and yet no one in any climate in history could have this kind of life. And the reason is because the thing that's so precious, the real thing that's precious and unique and that has never happened before, and that we really need to be concerned about first and foremost, is a high energy industrial civilization. Because we know that without that, um, we can't live this long. Before this, you know, before this kind of civilization, people live in thirty. So the most precious thing that we have in terms of the world around us is our ability to make it better. So if you say, well, there's going to be more CO2 in the atmosphere, there used to be 10 times more CO2 in the atmosphere in life thrive. There used to be many degrees higher. It was a lush world. Whatever it is, what I'm afraid of is not having energy, because I'm certain that means death. And and we, I, I don't think there's any basis at all for favoring these, the sun and the wind of all the things that we get energy from. I mean, any more than if, if someone said, let's produce all of our energy by like gold. You know, you would just, you wouldn't work, you would come out of it. it is, some technologies are just bad technology, so I don't know why we would go in that direction. What well, we what really about want. Rearranging lifestyles so that they don't need as much energy. Well, I mean, then that I'm against, for the reasons that I said. Again, you need twice as much energy to even get to Germany. So, what I just, the point I wanted to make is that, you know, the reason I say fossil fuels improve the planet is because we live overall on the greatest planet in history, and it's because we're a high energy planet. So, whatever we do, that has to be, you know, priority number one. And with that, thank you for staying and good fun. <laughs>